California Representative Ro Khanna appeared on Fox News yesterday and shared that he would consider voting for a moderate Republican for House Speaker. Let's take a look. I would consider the right Republican, someone I could trust, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, uh, Mike Gallagher, who actually spoke eloquently on the floor, David Joyce. Uh, but there need to be two conditions. One, you can't have debt ceiling, uh, the debt ceiling debate or shutdown uh, as something that takes the country hostage. And two, they'd have to be some agreement on subpoena power. But I, I'm open to uh, a Republican who could work to put the interests of the American people uh, first. Representative Ro Khanna joins us now to discuss. Welcome, Congressman. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So for those of us who were interested in these leverage opportunities back in the force the vote realm, it's really nice to hear you talking about this kind of conc concretizing list of asks that the left, that progressives, that Democrats could get out of the obstruction that's happening right now in Congress. You know, you've mentioned the debt ceiling. AOC uh, mentioned, I believe it was yesterday, that there uh, could be some committee appointments that come out of this. How likely do you think it is that you'll get those kinds of concessions? And if it's likely, why not uh, run up the score and try to get as much as possible in this moment? Well, I do agree with you, Brianna. We should try to run up the score. And the biggest thing would be if we could get six Republicans to vote for Hakeem Jeffries. And uh, <laughs> let's see, but that should be the, the first goal uh, to, to try to get uh, the Republicans to vote for Hakeem. If, it is, if that doesn't work, uh, what I've said is we need to have uh, re not just the personality of the right Republican, but concrete concessions that they don't hold this country uh, a, a hostage to a debt ceiling debate. Uh, as it is, there are people on the far right talking about not uh, raising the debt ceiling. That would be catastrophic for the world economy, that they commit to not shutting down the government, that there are uh, equal appointments on the committees uh, so that uh, we have equal subpoena power and can shut down frivolous uh, investigations. Uh, these are all things that uh, uh, we should uh, d demand. Um, it's so great to see you. Uh, last time you were here, I said that you sounded more like an America first populist than like a Democrat. And you made fun of me and laughed at me and said that I was erasing your whole progressive record. But I think <laughs> I'm being somewhat vindicated here. Um, is there anything you can tell us about um, behind the scenes conversations that you're having, um, either with Republicans um, or with fellow Democrats about, um, you know, potentially crossing that aisle? Well, there are informal conversations, but I don't think there's been anything uh, formal to, to, to that end. Uh, they are still, the Republicans, trying to, to get Kevin McCarthy to, to be speaker. Now, I know there's some uh, Democrats who are upset that I, I even floated this, but what is the alternative? Uh, the alternative is to get uh, a Kevin McCarthy or a Scalise uh, with commitments to the far right where we're going to have a debt ceiling showdown, where we're going to have a shutdown, and where we're going to have frivolous investigations into Hunter Biden. Uh, I'd rather that we either try for Hakeem as speaker or we try for uh, a Republican who's going to make concessions. And that's, that's why I floated uh, the idea. Congressman Khan, it's not a real possibility that Republicans would cross the aisle to vote for Hakeem Jeffries, is it? Well, look, there are a few Republicans in swing districts uh, as uh, as, as McCarthy continues to make all these concessions to the far right that may say, uh, I'm willing to do this, or Republicans who may be willing uh, to, to retire, who may or may be thinking of running for the Senate or governor. I, do I think it's a likely scenario? No. Uh, but is it worth pursuing? Absolutely. We should uh, try to pursue it at this time uh, where the Republican Party is really facing chaos. I mean, I ask in part because it's an interesting posture for a progressive like yourself to be in, to be advocating for someone like Hakeem Jeffries, who has been so historically hostile to progressives in the House. Obviously, there was the big kerfuffle earlier this year, or last year, rather, about the CPC, the Congressional Progressive Caucus's choice to endorse Chantel Brown over Nina Turner. Pramila Jayapal and Nina Turner both worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign, as you did. It's, it was felt to many people to be like a betrayal of what it meant to be on the Progressive Caucus in the first place. Akeem Jeffries has uh, co-founded this super PAC that's aimed at uh, 
defeating progressive challengers to the to uh, the attack Democratic incumbents from the left. And this is the person that there's an effort to uh, generate energy around uh, for the speakership. Is there any conversation happening about progressives using this opportunity to talk about how who they would prefer to be as a as a, a speaker that would better represent the interests of the left flank of the Democratic Party? As you know, Hakeem Jeffries is part of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, he has sat down with Progressive Caucus members. He sat down with uh, all of the caucus, and he had 212 votes. It was unanimous. Uh, now, are there areas that I am more progressive than uh, Hakeem Jeffries? Sure. I am for Medicare for all, uh, for Bernie Sanders' version of the bill. Uh, I am for free public college. I am for uh, making sure uh, that we uh, have very, very robust protections for, for labor unions and organizing and really should have uh, gotten rid of the parliamentarian to get the $15 minimum wage in the Senate. Uh, but uh, those are things that we can advocate strongly for, uh, and we have a better shot of doing that with Hakeem Jeffries as speaker uh, than with uh, Kevin McCarthy. But Representative Khanna, I'm sorry to belabor this, but surely you can see how folks looking at the past two years of the Biden administration and what happened with Nancy Pelosi in the speakership chair, who is a stronger uh, leader than Hakeem Jeffries just because of her legacy and the power that she's generated over the time that she's been in Congress. None of those agenda items, none of those progressive agenda items have been advanced. We saw the maneuvers that got the $15 minimum wage killed and stripped from the American Rescue Plan. We saw how the Build Back Better bill was bifurcated so that all the good progressive stuff could be junked at the earliest opportunity and blamed on Manchin and Cinema. We've seen people completely stop talking about Medicare for All, a Green New Deal, which Hakeem Jeffries has been, you know, very critical of and won't sign on to, even though he's a New York congressman. Why should progressives, why should people generally on the left, broadly, including the 30 percent of uh, voters who voted for Bernie Sanders, believe that there could be any sincere progress on any of those core popular issues with K Hakeem Jeffries in, with, with the gavel in the leadership spot? Well, because we did make progress in the last two years. So we made progress on getting a child tax credit. We made progress on massive uh, American Rescue Plan investment in our public schools. Temporary in our policies that expired, Representative. That's that's people's concern, that there were these pandemic era policies that were very popular and effective, but those were allowed to lapse. And now people feel like it's back to business as usual and that the progressive momentum has been completely killed. Well, I think that's not giving Senator Sanders and the progressive movement enough credit. I mean, that also led to the historic climate legislation. Now, it's not what you or I would have wanted, 300 uh, billion over 10 years. I mean, we... I'm on the Thrive Act, which is going about a trillion dollar investment every year in really a transformation uh, of our uh, of our clean uh, economy. But I do think that the progressive that uh, this is growing, we have Greg Cesar, we've got Jonathan Jackson, many members. Uh, we're going to continue to advocate. Do I think we can get these goals without a progressive president? No. Do I think ultimately we need uh, to, to take back the House? Yes. But we, we're making progress, and the progress would be much more with the Jeffries uh, than with any Republican uh, it, having control. Yeah. I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about something you tweeted um, yesterday. You wrote millions of Ameri that millions of Americans have seen their livelihoods evaporate due to 30 years of bad trade deals that shipped manufacturing jobs overseas. And then you wrote hashtag economic patriotism is how we can begin to reverse this process and deliver for the people again. I love this. Um, I also loved it when this was um, Steve Bannon's agenda for getting Trump elected. He famously said, um, you know, we want them talking about racism all day and identity politics day and night. Well, we're going to win with, he called it, of course, economic nationalism. Um, I'm wondering if that chimes for you as well, or if I'm just trying to belabor this point that, that you have a lot of potential partners on the the right when it comes to this kind of economic populism? Well, I believe that these trade deals were terrible. NAFTA, the WTO, we made a colossal mistake letting our factories go offshore. I think the difference with economic patriotism is it doesn't reject the value of immigrants. It doesn't reject uh, the value of engaging in a global economy. It simply says that America ought to leave there. America ought to be uh, investing in our factories. And philosophically, where I disagree with Steve Bannon and the Trump agenda is their view of it was let's get the corporate tax cuts and that would somehow bring these factories back. I know a lot of these uh, corporate CEOs in my district at Intel would take the tax cut and put the factories in Malaysia 
I think what we need is the government to say, we're going to invest uh, in these companies if they invest in America and in American labor. And so it's a different philosophy. I'd say it's more in common with FDR uh, than with Steve Bannon. <laughs> but uh, to the extent people want to be for the goal of bringing factories back and bringing industry back in this country, I'll work with anyone. I have a bill with Marco Rubio uh, to try to do that. Rokana, you mentioned uh, a little while ago that you don't think any number of progressive um, priorities will be pursued absent having a progressive candidate, uh, perhaps more progressives represented in Congress. I wonder what you think when you look at how much leverage these 20 rebellious Republicans have garnered for themselves not by having a uh, uh, Republican in the White House and not by having overwhelming majorities in the House or a majority at all in the Senate, but by using this procedural maneuver, by exploiting the fact that they have a narrow margin to that a small number of people can hold up the entire government's agenda. Do you look at that and say, given the lack of likelihood that progressives are going to have these overwhelming majorities or to win the White House in the, in the near future. And given the gravity of the crises that we are facing as a country, the health care crises, the housing crises, the, the, and on and on and on and on, do you have regrets about progressives not using that opportunity to do the same thing back in 2021 when there was a force of vote moment whereby progressives could be the ones that are grandstanding right now. And instead of talking about big procedural issues, really highlighting substantive concerns and holding the Democratic Party hostage until they deliver on things like, let's say, for example, immediately signing uh, an executive order to cancel all student debt before it could be obstructed by the courts. Well, I, I, I heard the sense of urgency, but I think you're uh, adjective of grandstanding is accurate of what uh, people on the on the right are doing. Uh, look, it's easy if your ideology is we just want to shut everything down. We're not. We don't want to raise the debt ceiling. We want to shut government down. Uh, maybe they'll succeed uh, in doing that. Though right now it's unclear if they're going to get any of their policy recommendations. But on the progressive left, we have uh, something which is far tougher. We're telling people to affirmatively pass legislation create Medicare for all, uh, create uh, dental vision uh, and hearing benefits for seniors, uh, raise the wage. You can't do that just by a, a sense of we're going to blow the place up. We've got to actually get people to draft the legislation, support the legislation. So I think the tactics are different because we're trying to build something. They're trying to just uh, blow up institutions by their own uh, their own. Uh, definition of what they consider success. Do you believe that Nancy Pelosi would not have acquiesced? I'm sorry, Batya. But do you believe that she would not have acquiesced, that she would have risked the gavel, had voting go on for days or weeks, et cetera, instead of exchanging it for something as simple as committing to signing the executive order uh, to cancel student debt, or let's say actually having the floor vote, vote on the bill to uh, vote uh, to see if you can end uh, insider trading in uh, the House, something which people have argued and it's been reported on that she quietly killed because she's expressed displeasure at being prevented from uh, trading as a Congress member? Do you think that she would have, uh, you know, basically not, not acquiesced to those kind of demands? And if you believe she would have acquiesced to those kind of demands, do you have regrets over not actually trying to get those real concrete concessions for the left? Well, look, I support, obviously, the ban on, 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 on stock trading. That came up about months into her speakership at the time of the speakership what people were talking about was Medicare for all and I don't think she uh, would have acquiesced to being able to deliver Medicare for all because the votes aren't there right now uh, in, in in the House of Representatives so my view of it is that we need to build the progressive caucus with people who are going to uh, vote for it we need to elect a, a, a progressive president or a progressive nominee we need to change the party if you remember in 2020 I voted against the platform of our own party because it did not have Medicare for all. We need to start with that. Uh, and uh, I, I, yes, could we have a grandstand and gotten in, in the news for a week? Sure. Do I think that would have gotten us any closer to Medicare for all or $15 wage? I honestly don't. If I thought but, it but, would, but I, I would have But Representative Khanna, it. it could be any ask, not just Medicare for all. So we could talk about any number of executive orders. We could talk about the kind of procedural changes, pay-go exemptions, the debt ceiling, all of the things that you've said you think you could potentially get out of the Republican obstruction in this moment. Why the optimism about what you can get out of the Republicans in negotiations now, but short-sightedness about what Democrats could have gotten in the same moment in 2021? 
Well, what I'm trying to get out of the Republicans is are things that uh, the speaker would agree with. I'm trying to say we need to increase the debt ceiling. We shouldn't shut down the government. Uh, we shouldn't have frivolous investigations on Biden. Uh, Pelosi or uh, King Jeffries would agree with all of that. Uh, we're trying to get the Republicans to a place where they're concerned about governing. There are two separate questions, Brianna. One is, can we actually govern in a way uh, that is uh, sensible? Uh, and then the broader question, can we get progressive goals that actually help, help the working class? Right now, we've got the first crisis, which is uh, just can we have sane people governing and not have this country default on the debt? That isn't sufficient for our politics. We have that broader aspirations of progressive politics. But I think the only way we get those broader progressive aspirations is winning at the local level, state level, governorships, state parties, changing the party, and having someone like Sanders ultimately win the nomination. So one last final question, really quick. Um, speaking of working class Americans and actual legislation, um, there was a bill introduced by Andy Levin and um, Congressman Van Drew, a bipartisan bill called the Guaranteeing Truckers Overtime Act. All it does is say that truckers may no longer be exempt from overtime, which they are right now. Um, Andy Levin lost his primary, and so he's no longer in Congress. I'm wondering if um, this bill has crossed your path and if it's something that you would support. Your description, I would strongly support it. I, it has not crossed my path. I appreciate you raising it, and I'll have my team look into it. Andy Levin was one of the uh, best uh, Congress people for working class issues, first uh, congressional office to unionize. Uh, he's been out there, and I'm sure if he's backing it, it's the right type of priority for working class Americans, and I'm glad it's bipartisan. Yeah, Andrew Levin, of course, famously attacked by uh, 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 the DMFI super PAC that uh, helped to lead to him not winning his race. Another instance of this kind of Democratic Party, that, which oftentimes weaponizes itself against the left. I'm sure that's an ongoing conversation we'll be having. Representative, we appreciate you so much joining us here today. Always enjoy it. Thanks so much for having me. And we'll have more Rising for you right after this. <laughs> 